How you guys doing? All right. Raise your hand if you've sold me a pinball machine. Uh, Stern, thank you. Oh, you guys too? Okay. Raise your hand if you bought a pinball machine from the pinball company. Oh, thank you. A couple of you guys. I don't think anybody's heard the entire story of the pinball company and how it started. People have heard a little bit. So even my guys, my four guys here that are from the pinball company, I think are going to hear some things that they don't know about. Um, and my wife, Brooke, is going to keep me on track. We we're going to bring a buzzer. So uh, if I got off topic. <laughs> oh. Test, test. Oh. Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, Nick sometimes gets a little long-winded, so um, I'm going to either nudge him or give him a stare. I don't know. We were talking about different <laughs> signals I can give. But uh, anyway, I'll try to keep him on track. Well, first of all, I want to just uh, thank Rob Burke, Rob Burke for inviting me. Um, and yeah, there he is. Thank you for inviting me back and uh, all the work you do for the expo. I didn't see the Hercules machine and the Flintstones when I first walk in, so... I'm going to think that was a positive. We're at least making some change. Um, so I'm going to take you guys back because uh, a lot of questions I get um, are why, how did you get into the pinball business? Um, and and I'll, I'll talk, talk about the beginnings of the pinball business, how we got into it, some of the early days, challenges that we went through. I'll give you kind of the timeline of the website because for us it's all about the website, driving traffic to the website, selling pinball machines online. Um, and then we'll move on to some of the current challenges we're going through and how we hope to solve some of those problems as an online pinball retailer. Um, uh -oh, hold on. Oh, for the battery. <laughs> Plug it in. Okay. So, um, 2006. Um, we both graduated from the University of Missouri with uh, our MBAs, that's where we met. And she got a job at Macy's and I was applying to PhD programs throughout the country I'm, with the goal of maybe being a college professor at the University of Missouri. And I didn't get into any schools. Uh, I, I was pretty ambitious in the ones I wanted to get into, but in the meantime, I took a job, my buddy Jeff, um, who was working at Amini's in St. Louis. Anybody heard of Amini's? The Stern guys, of course, yeah. So they, this is huge game room retailer. They sell pool tables, um, game room furniture, um, you know, lighting, everything for a home game room, but it's huge. Yeah. And the rugs, and the rugs. Yeah, please raise your hand, make comments as you think about something, can you keep things going. Um, and I walked in there with sandals and shorts on. I found out that later on that you probably needed to do that, a shirt and tie for an interview, but I just walked in there. My buddy said, yeah, I'll, I'll introduce you to the owner. I got hired on the spot, so I was a pool table salesman. And um, about 90 days in, he, he uh, calls me into his offices and he says, you know, normally what we do um, when you first get hired is we give you this piece of paper. It's no big deal, just sign it. It actually just means that you're not gonna compete with us should you leave here. And I thought that was kind of odd. And I said, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, give it to me. I'll have my, re my lawyer reviewed it. I didn't really have a lawyer at the time. But I said, yeah, sure, go ahead and give it to me. I'll, I'll take a look at it. In that 90 days, um, <clears throat> I kind of think like a consultant. And uh, you know, I don't know if it's NBA or just my nature. is Everybody I work for, and I've worked for a lot of people, uh, I, I'm, already, I'm going in, I'm critiquing their business and how I can make it better. And so you know, Arash knew that about me and, um, you know, I was having a hard time signing this because I'd learned so much, and in fact, I kind of figured out that we made a, a lot of profit per square foot in that little corner that we sold pinball machines. It was about maybe even a quarter of the size of this room, probably 25 pinball machines, and I thought, that's really cool. So I did some research, and I found out that there was an online retailer um, in Florida called BMI Gaming. I'm sure you've heard about them. And I was like, if this guy can do it with that website, because I thought I can build a better website, certainly I can do this too. And he made the mistake of being on CNBC, or at least interviewed on CNBC, saying that I'm, I'm going to do $7 million next year, and he was so successful. And I'm the type of guy who says, well, if he can do it, I can do it. And so um, I did not sign that piece of paper in part because my father-in-law, uh, I gave him a call on the way to sign it, and he said, I believe in you. What's your idea? I said, I'm going to sell pinball machines online. He said, I believe in you, and that's, I, that's what I decided to do. I didn't have any... It, 
particular interest in pinball machines per se, other than I recognize the market opportunity. People always ask that, have you always been in the pinball? Are you a, a pinball master? Are you really good at pinball? And the answer is no. Um, I just saw a market opportunity to sell pinball machines, and, and, and of course I've learned a lot about pinball since, but um, I started the pinball company. I was thinking about the name, what should I call it? I'm pretty basic, um, so I said let's call it the pinball company. The URL, the name's not taken, and so that's why it's called the pinball company. I just thought, hey, it's really basic. Is it? Oh. I'm going to keep going while they try to figure this out. Um, so where were we? Um, I decided to start the pinball company. She's got a real job. I decided, you know, I'm going to start an online retail website selling pinball machines. And to do that, I thought, well, I'm going to get some money together, so I'm going to have to go to the bank and get a loan. Unfortunately, the banks didn't think that was a great idea either. So my, my former employer didn't think it was a good idea. My wife thought, eh, I don't know, maybe you should just sign the piece of paper and keep your job. And my bank was like, no, we're not going to give you any money. That sounds kind of crazy. So I ended up um, just maxing out my credit card. I always tell people $10,000. I don't know what the exact amount was, but it was in the thousands of dollars that I just put on my credit card. And of course, you have to register your domain name, you know, get a website built. I got a toll-free number, everything I needed to do to kind of like get this website going. Um, and on August 30th, 2006, I launched the website, the pinballcompany.com, and I did I start, launched my Google AdWords campaign. Um, so I've been doing that for 12 years, but it all started with Google AdWords. And I, I had this toll-free number ringing to a cell phone, and we were at the Lake of the Ozark at my mom's house, and sure enough, the phone starts ringing. And, um, and he pulls off the road. We were back on these windy roads, and the phone rings, and he pulls off the road, <coughs> talking to his first customer, and I think he sold a pinball machine so right then and there. Yeah, and the I'm thinking, what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any pinball machines to sell. Yeah, I think, <laughs> we, and we didn't, and, and we'll get to that. But, um, yeah, she was kind of, I think she's working Skeptical. her job. Yeah. I think she thought that I was at home playing Warcraft every day when I was working on my website. Um, but I really was. I, I put a lot into it, you know, back then. I was making it. She was, had a real job, and I thought, she's going to leave me if this doesn't work because I'm a, a loser. I didn't get into, you know, PhD programs. You know, I left my job as a pool table sales guy, and I, I'm playing Warcraft all day. So what am I doing with this loser? But uh, I told her, you know, early on, I told her, things are working. She didn't quite get it. You're selling pinball machines that you don't have. So let me get into that a little bit while they're still working on the technology. So people always ask me, you know, so you didn't get any loan, you started this website, so how are you in the business of selling pinball machines? Well, no, I was not direct with any manufacturers. I wasn't selling direct um, Stern Pinball. They were the only guys at the time. Um, I was basically just, I knew what I could get used machines for, and I marked them up. So I do the same thing today, it's crazy. But nobody was really selling used pinball machines online, so it was just an open market. Um, certainly, Mr. What was the, Mr. Pinball was one of the first ones. There were, that existed. I think Pinside existed, but I didn't know it existed. Um, eBay existed. You know, we we, uh, we we knew what we could buy for them. And there was a great pi price guy, which I still have the Mr. Pinball price guy, and I knew that I used that as my wholesale value, right? So. <coughs> Sounds kind of hokey. Uh, I think a lot of businesses do it. It's called fake it till you make it. And um, what, what I did was that, I'm going to go back to that first customer. The guy says, 
I'm looking for, I have like 50 machines on the website, you know, the ones that I think are good, and, I'm, and I've got a price to sell them. This guy says, I'm looking for 1978 Rolling Stones. And of course, being tr classically trained by Aminis in St. Louis to be a pool table sales guy, I said, oh yeah, sure, I got five of them. You know, I, was, I don't know if I said exactly that, but I said, sure, no problem, it'll be $3,000. And he says, okay, that's no problem. I said, I actually got another one that's really, really nice. If you're looking for something really nice, I, I can sell that to you for 3500 So this is like the classic car salesman, yeah, right? Um, and he says, oh yeah, that, that's awesome, I'll take both. And I'm like, okay, give me your credit card number. And so I, I wrote it up and, uh, and uh, took the order. And that customer up in Baltimore, uh, of course I remember that forever, he, um, he got his first machine I bought it from Todd at TNT Amusements, who Aminis uses a vendor who speaks after this. So, um, <clears throat> and then it took months for me to try to find another one. I never found another one. I called the guy and said I apologize. But what I did was early on is I took that money, I bought that machine, had it shipped to them, and I bought another machine. So what it was, whoa, wait a minute, you didn't touch the machine? No, I, I we didn't. It's honest. This is, I'm I'm going back to the beginning and I'm telling you truths that you know are somewhat embarrassing. Um, and I was embarrassed. Here I am selling machines I don't have. I knew what I can buy them for. I was basically making a market for pinball machines here. I was selling to retail customers, buying wholesale, and I wasn't touching the machines at the time. Eventually I learned, pretty quickly, I learned that these machines actually do break. So I needed to figure out that side of the business. And so basically every customer that bought a used pinball machine, thank you, thank you. Um, Everybody who bought a used pinball machine who lived in whatever city, I ultimately, if they had a problem, I had to find a technician. Of course, today we've built, uh, uh, we've built a network of technicians all across the country that we're pretty proud of, but, but back then we had to fake it. Um, so, was there something else on that slide? Or? I think I covered it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay, we covered it. So me and Brooke are the owners. Okay. So this is, this is the first website, and I'm not gonna say that this is exactly the website looked like in August or October, the, the, you know, September, the first couple of months. This is January of 2007, and it, it doesn't look bad. I think it looks better than BMI's website even today. I mean, they've had the same website for years, but that was the guy I was benchmarking with. So as long as it looked better, it had pinball machines on it, you can click and buy, toll-free number, I'm in business. You'll notice here, and by this point, this was our actual showroom. So in just a short year, you had rented a space, 1,800 square foot space, and we probably had, I don't know, 30, 40 30, machines. 30, 40 machines, yeah. yeah. So we quickly built up quite a bit of inventory. Yeah, and, and when you start a business, and, and I was still in my mid-20s, and, and you've got money coming in, and you've got to buy machines, and certainly what's left over is profit. It's so like easy just to go, I'm gonna go buy a you know BMW or something, but of course I didn't. I just bought machines because I- bought this. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> bought the ring, yes. Put a ring on it very early on. As soon as I can afford one. Um, but what I was getting at was that uh, I was somewhat embarrassed. I mean, I'm embarrassed, I'm embarrassed. Like I was, this is, I know this business, I have proof of concept. I knew the business was going to work and I wanted to immediately not be faking it anymore. So I decided I wanted inventory. So when I, when I sold the machine, I would take the profit and I would go buy another machine that became inventory. So the website very quickly evolved into stuff that I actually had. So when I would say I was faking it, yeah, I was. I wanted to make sure that that was working before I bought 100 pinball machines, right? But as soon as I knew it was, it was work, gonna work, I acquired inventory pretty quickly. We filled our garage, we filled the storage, we, we, and then we very quickly signed a lease um, on Hanley Road in St. Louis for the showroom. And um, go ahead. Yeah. this is our grand opening, um, me and Brooke and my buddy Jeff that worked at Aminis with me. So as soon as I told him, I said, this is working, come work with me. Okay, fine. And then the guy on the right is his buddy from the military, Lloyd, um, really funny guy, worked with us for a while. But you notice the showroom uh, by our grand opening, we, you know, we owned all that stuff. And we did have Stearns in there. We weren't direct with Stern. We were buying Stearns from Jersey Jack, actually. In, in 2006, 2007, he was my distributor because I wanted to sell new Sterns and you know looked him up and said, "Hey, yeah, sure, I'll sell, I'll sell you Sterns." Um, and eventually, at some point, I don't know why, he said, "Why don't you just go buy them from Betson?" I'm like, "Who's Betson?" So he introduced me, introduced me to a guy named Alan Zeidman, and 
here in Chicago at Betson, and I was buying them from, from him. So I was selling new Sterns, I was selling the used machines that I knew I could get and the ones that I had in the showroom. And within a few months, this was a legitimate business, and I knew it was going to work uh, as long as I kept working hard at it. By, this is approximately one year in, and um, the website is coming along. Um, I don't know if you remember what websites looked like you know, 10, 11 years ago, but they weren't like Amazon today. This was actually a pretty decent looking website. I mean, I think ever since the beginning, people have always said, you have a great website. And I'm like, thanks, I'm still working on it. Um, but we have the toll-free number, we have the Visa MasterCard. Um, you'll notice the changes there. We show the St. Louis um, showroom there, um, and you know, it's coming along. 2008, I'm not going to get into the whole legal story about why we moved to Columbia, Missouri, but um, basically my former employer didn't like the fact that I was opening my second location right across the street from him in Chesterfield, and we settled on, I'm just going to move. Um, that's the long story short. So we moved uh, to Columbia, Missouri, where there's nobody sort of selling pinball machines, and of course nobody even at that point selling pool tables. So we thought, let's open a store, let's call it the Game Room Store. Um, kind of like a mini Aminis, because he could do it, we could do it too. And uh, you'll see we have five pinball machines, well, six pinball machines in this showroom. Where did they all go? Well, we still had some in storage and whatnot, but in, in our basement at home and things like that. But ultimately, we were trying to morph this into, you know, selling new stern machines, um, selling used machines, and um, selling a lot of pool tables, shuffleboards, things that you would sell. And our website was evolving too. We were adding these types of products to our website, foosball tables, air hockey tables, so forth. Um, that didn't work so well. Um, Columbia, Missouri didn't quite get it. They'd walk into the showroom and be like, how much are pinball machines? And that's still happening today, but th there wasn't a big enough market to sell pinball machines and pool tables in Columbia, Missouri to make it work. So we just ran the internet business out of there for five years. We ran that lease out. Um, and some of the best memories of our life early on and doing things at the, ga at the game room store. My son was born. We changed his diaper on the Not pool table. Not at the game room store. Not at the game room store. <laughs> but we changed but his diaper at the game room store. <laughs> on, yeah, on the pool table. And he, like, was there on his little play mat, gr you know, little baby, and grew up in the store. Um, I met a guy named Mark Montgomery who left this room because he's actually in the parking lot getting a pinball machine from somebody we bought from. Um, I met Vaughn Davis, who's also here. He, uh, he worked at the local family fun center and we recruited him to, he was an engineering student, we recruited him to be a pinball technician. Um, and ultimately, I think the next slide. No, nope, that's us in, the, in there, so you can see. Um, 2009, I wanted to point 2009 out. You see the Better Business Bureau logo? Any, any website even today, it's all about you know, looking legitimate. And, you, know, you, know, you want to th see things that make people feel comfortable spending a lot of money by, on, from an online retailer. So you'll see Better Business Bureau, toll-free number, a lot of the same things. But by, by this point, our low prices have made us the most visited website that specializes in the restoration of pinball machines we, with over a million visitors and a thousand customers, yada, yada, yada. Um, I want, if I was gonna sell pinball machines online, I wanted to be number one, and that was my feeling from the very beginning. Um, and the, the last, last website version said we were the second, second most visited. And so I think website traffic has always been, I wanted to be the most visited website and I thought the, the, uh, the sales would follow. But by this point, we have, uh, we've become the most visited website. This is 2011, this is another iteration of our website. Um, you can see we added live help on the upper right hand corner and again, Better Business Bureau logo there exists. And here we fast forward to present day. And we launched this website um, last March. Um, so it's, we've had about a year and a half. You'll see in the lower left hand corner we have pre-qualify now. That's our uh, financing that we started doing last year that's working really well for us. In the lower right hand corner we got rid of the live chat button. Now when you click on that, it actually texts me. Um, you actually text our office number, but it actually texts me and I answer the customer you know, emails right there. If you go to the website, this isn't the actual first slide, but since it's the pinball box, but for the, the first thing on our slider is a picture of me and Brooke. And that's not, you know, us bragging or anything. It's actually very effective because we wanted to maintain that family-friendly feel, like this is family-owned business. And we say, and we do, when you call us, 
we've, you don't have to press one for this or press two for that. You actually get one of us on the phone. And that's really important when you're spending a lot of money from a guy you don't know um, for a pinball machine because when it breaks, you want that same type of feel good. Like, I know when I call, Brooke or Nick are going to answer and they're going to help me with my pinball machine. So that's always been a part of our, a very important part of our business is to maintain that family friendly feel. Like, you know, I know these people. They're not just like, you know, the Amazon of pinball. These are real people running a business. Uh, yeah. So when the game room store lease ended, we moved to the Columbia showroom, which is on 11 acres. Um, has 4,000 square foot warehouse, showroom, office, and shop. Um, at this time when we moved in, um, I asked uh, a guy that I knew was in the pinball hobby, Dan Gett, I asked him, I've got this guy Mark, he's been working for me kind of, you know, uh, hourly, you know, type deal. I want to pay, put him on the payroll and I, I want to pay him, you know, full-time salary. What would I pay a guy that basically 24 hours, you know, you know, basically 40 days a week works on pinball machines. What would I pay a guy like that? And Dan said, I don't know what the number was, but he says, I would pay somewhere around here. And in fact, you know, I've worked this place for seven years. I'm kind of burnt out. If you'll pay that, I will come work for you for that. And so I ended up kind of getting a two for one. Of course, I kept Mark and then I couldn't pass up on Dan because I knew he was so talented and very- I remember how talented. ecstatic we were when we learned that Dan was gonna come work for us. I mean, his work is phenomenal. If you guys know him, he, his attention to detail and, and the work that he does on refurbishing our machines is second to none. So we were just so thrilled that he was gonna come work for us full time and just really um, you know, keep the level of the quality of our machines you know, better than anywhere you could find. It was kind of like if you're a major pinball manufacturer and you line that, bi you, you, you basically, you land that big designer. We had that feeling like that this is a game changer for the pinball company. It's not just this guy that we taught how to tinker on pinball machines and fix them. This is a guy who is a hardcore pinball enthusiast who had, again, his collection and when he refurbishes a machine, it's way more than what we do for our current customers. And it was a game changer. Um, that he said, yeah, I w and we were like ecstatic. So um, here, this you know, Mark um, is the guy that I um, first hired to work on pinball machines on a more full-time basis. Uh, this isn't right. Hold on. Ah, that looks good. To the <laughs> to the right of Mark, to the left in his picture, is Vaughn is in that picture. I didn't know he was going to be here, so I cropped him out. But since he's here, I feel bad, so I was going to drag that picture out so you can see he's there. But Vaughn was obviously a pinball technician for us for a while, not currently, but um, um, was, was a great asset for us to have at the time since he had engineering experience. He helped work on the early days of the Jetsons project. He was working on that. But Dan and Nathan, so since we've gotten um, Nathan uh, as a full-time technician as well, and these three guys, I couldn't do what we do. We couldn't refurbish the number of machines that we refurbish every year without these guys and the level of quality you know, with, the, with Dan and Nathan is just absolutely great. We actually advertise on our website our full refurbishing process. This is what we do to every single machine that we sell. And before, we, I would be not embarrassed to say, but now I'm, now I'm very confident that when we send out a refurbished machine that it's gonna be top quality. This is the showroom probably like two, three years ago. Um, and you notice that there's not a lot of cardboard in this picture. It's really just all refurbished pinball machines. I, mean, I think we kind of peaked out at like 100 to 120. Kind of looks like the Pinball Expo, but you know, in our little warehouse there. A lot of, um, you know, this right-hand side, a lot of Stern machines. Um, you've got a lot of Williams Valley machines over there on what we call the showroom side. Um, but th things have changed the last few years. Um, there are pin more pinball manufacturers and um, particularly Stern Pinball is making a lot more machines and making them for longer. So. The next slide will show you what it looks like. I'm gonna say today, but maybe like two weeks ago, we've since organized a little better, but you see the big boxes on the right are show, um, ski ball lanes. We've got new box Stern machines, um, Miss Pat Gallagher's, Arcade Legends, down the aisle there, all those boxes are um, golden tees. We sell a ton of golden tees. Um, so we're, we have a problem. We, have, we, we need more space. Um, we would like to always have 100 refurbished machines 
but we also need space for new new in box machines. So we're kind of balancing that out. So it's a problem that we're going to kind of try to solve. I thought it might be interesting to go through. I'm a very num by the numbers guy, and I thought it might be interesting for you to know the top selling pinball machines that we've sold in 12 years. <coughs> and um, Wizard of Oz comes out at the top um, in part because we were the first U.S. distributor, um, and we committed to a lot of units, and, and it sold really well early on at a you know at the early on price point, and that's of course risen. Um, you'll see Adam's family, 130. So we started this company in 2006, but we've sold 130 of a machine that was built in 1992. So just imagine if you want to buy an Adam's family today or even 10 years ago, you, it's not that easy. I mean, they made a lot of them, but you got to go out, do your research and find one. Then for us, we have to refurbish it to a higher level, ship it to a customer, and then warranty it. Um, our warranty is one year on parts and 30 days on labor. That's a lot of Adams families um, to find in good condition. Isn't it, Nathan? <laughs> <laughs> he shops everyone that comes through our store. <laughs> I just thought that was interesting. When you say I've sold, you know, X hundred, um, you know, whatever new machine, that's that's great. But to actually find 130 Adams families in the last 12 years, refurbish them to a high quality, and ship them to customers across the country, you would think that our phones are ringing off the hook with, my machine's broken, my machine's broken, my machine's broken. Well, maybe early on in the days if we did that kind of volume, but my guys do such a good job um, that, you know, we, we don't have a high, what we call warranty expense, because we, you know, we, we, uh, we, we refurbish the machines very well. Um, Star Wars, brand new, ACDC, brand new, Pirates of the Caribbean, a lot of, lot of licensed games here, a lot of stern machines. But th I just thought that would be interesting. We sold, I think, uh, right around 4,000 pinball machines in the last 12 years. A lot of that skewed is in the last five years. We've really kind of ramped things up. But um, go on to the next slide. Um, we have a wall of fame in the showroom, and it's kind of more just for us because we think it's exciting to sell to somebody who you know is you know, a celebrity or an athlete or whatever. So I bought a certain number of frames from Target, and we put them on the wall. And as we get a more famous guy than the other guy, we take his picture out, he goes in the trash, and then we put the new one in. I would say this is about the A team. I think, don't think we even have enough frames for well, all We have one that we need to add, just from the last month. Who's that? I don't know how to say that. Oh, oh. Ben, ben Roethlisberger, yeah, you know. He called I didn't me. know who this was. He's the lower left corner, yeah, right. He's, I put him on there, I had to, yeah. But he, he bought a big Buck Hunter Pro uh, Stern machine uh, from us a couple weeks ago, called called me, talked to him, and this is funny. I mean, I can give you a ton of these stories, but you know, he's like, "Yeah, I want you, you sent me pictures of this machine. I'm ready to buy it." Okay, what's your name, Ben? And he starts spelling his last name. Okay, I remember. Email address is Redhawk Seven. What Redhawk QB Seven at G. Oh, I'm sorry. I I didn't mean to give <laughs> Ben Roethlisberger's Gmail. Uh, I'm sorry. It was something like that. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I, I, it's kind of like this moment where you're like, yeah, I know who you are, <laughs> but you don't want to say that because it's kind of awkward. But I think he knew that, you know, that I knew who he was. Any guy probably knows him. But, but you, some of these people we talk to, and they're just, you know, it's great. And other people you don't talk to, Brian Urlacher, we talk to, great guy from Chicago, put him on there. Um, but not all of our customers are athletes and celebrities. I just put that up there because our wall of fame exists and this, we would never put this on the website to say, hey, look at our customers. This is the first time ever that it's been published. And I thought you guys might be interested in some people who own pinball machines. Every single one of these, well, not only pinball machines, but most part, own a pinball machine. Um, and we, you know, so, go ahead. Um, let's get into some of, just some of the details about, you know, where our customers are. And it'll lead into the, kind of the challenge you have as being an online retailer based in Columbia, Missouri. Um, the next slide will show you um, more numbers, and this is five years of website traffic. So if we go back five years, we have the right-hand column is the unique. So we have 246,000 people that live in New York City who have visited our website. Chicago, 183,000 people that live in Chicago have been to our website. Um, so you start to see some interesting numbers. Um, you don't see Columbia, Missouri on this list, <laughs> you know, and that's where we're based. But um, LA, Dallas, Fort Worth, DC, Philadelphia, so forth. So just to give you an idea of where our website visitors are, not everybody buys, but you know, it gives you an idea. And the next slide, um, 
again, website traffic, I wanted to be number one. I thought, you know, that's gonna, eyeballs, number one website traffic, that's gonna lead them number one in sales. Well, people don't tell you how many pinball machines they sell. That's okay. It's not like we're all public traded companies where you can see and you can kind of like, okay, now we're gonna try to beat them in revenue. So traffic was my thing. Now, and when Facebook became a big thing, we decided that we wanted to have a Facebook page and get a lot of visitors there. We said, I'm gonna be number one. Um, I do believe, I haven't checked in a while, I do believe we have more Facebook fans than people who like pinball, you know, because you could like snowboarding or whatever. You, you can check that, but it's, it's, it's not the number one anymore. We really more focus on having people who are actually been to our website who are potential customers and keep them in the loop. But that number is still kind of interesting to know how many people. And the next slide will show um, where those people are. And you'll notice that Chicago's number one. About 3,800 people in the Chicago area are Facebook fans. Um, of, our, of our business, so they've probably been to our website and said, I'm, I'm either a customer or I'm gonna buy later or I'm really interested in learning more about this company, we think. Um, and that's within New York, so New York was by website traffic, but Chicago, so Chicago really is, has a really heart for pinball and is, you know, to this day still the home of pinball. So yeah, the last time I spoke, the first time I spoke here, um, they, they asked me to speak about Gamer Magazine and why did I start the thing? What was my intent there? And really the idea there was to keep my customers and people interested in game room products in the loop as to the new products that were out. I hired an editor um, to put, together, put the magazine together and a local artist named David Spear to do the cover art. I pay him about $1,000 per cover and uh, we're really proud of the art he does on there. We're, we're not gonna do it unless we're gonna put out a quality magazine and people are like, well, I haven't gotten an issue in a while. My editor got a full-time job, but if you go to the next slide, you'll see issue seven. Uh, you've got parts of the, we're trying to be impartial, so we kind of go from like manufacturing. We've had spooky pinball, we've had JGS. We kind of we kind of go from side to side. But um, I texted this to the people at JGP because he, he just comes up with something. I say, Pirates of the Caribbean, see what you got. Here's some pictures of the pinball machine. This is what you got, um, and you've got you know Jack Sparrow there, and he's kind of worried, and. Uh, and the people at Jersey Jack are going, I, don't, I like it, but I don't know, I like the expression on his face. And I said, uh, this artist, you don't wanna, you know, what he does, you don't wanna mess with it. So, okay, I guess we can live with it. So, um, but go ahead, go to the next one. The waves are crashing in and he's worried. I don't know why they wouldn't like that. Um, challenges for online pinball retailers. Number seven's coming. We've been working on it. We, the intent was to do it twice as big, so my printing costs are less. Something you can put on your coffee table, um, and, and it's coming very soon. We hope to have it here, but it's not quite done. Um, so, just like we didn't go through all the early Vegas floor mat, but that's just a, that's okay. So many stories early on, and how we decided to logistically get people machines. I actually used. Um, piece of glass on top of a US map and I busted out the 50th anniversary risk board which is like metal pieces, little metal armies. And the red armies re represented deliveries and the green armies represented pickups. And I bought a used U-Haul and we named her Betsy for $1,500 and I hired a family friend of ours, Kevin, to drive around the country and deliver and pick up pinball machines. And this was before we knew that Naval existed. Now it's STI or whatever. So that all is a big funny story and I just told it to you in 30 seconds. But it's a little, and there's a little more to it. There's more to it, that, but, but we're running out of time I think. Um, Betsy eventually broke down in Illinois, and I, he called me up and I said, just leave it. We're gonna, we, there's gotta be a better way. <laughs> um, so just like, you know, gosh, how am I gonna service all these customers? I gotta find technicians nationwide. How am I gonna get them to them was a problem before that. And um, we just bought a used truck and decided we were gonna be a logistics company and deliver and pick up pinball machines all across the country. And we did that for several, a couple months at least before Kevin kind of got burnt out and the truck broke down, so. Um, that was a good story. Any other good stories from early on? That was the main one, okay. Um, so many stories. Um, but let's go, let's get to present day. Um, so just like those challenges that we had to figure out, there are new challenges that we have to face every day running a business. And one of those things is that um, pinball's doing really well. So you got a lot of manufacturers and you can only be one of the biggest pinball retailers for a while before people figure out that there's money to be made make selling pinball machines online and now you've got um, you know part suppliers like Marco and Bay Area and Pinball Life selling new pinball machines and 
And if you open up Arcade, you can, you can be a distributor. I mean, it's just it's like everybody is selling new pinball machines. And so that pie is getting chopped up and we're just one of those people. So how, what are we gonna do to differentiate ourselves? So that's a challenge that we face and we've always been trying to grow the pie. You know, spend more money on advertising, bring more people to pinball and that works fine. But to be honest to this day, to, to today, I don't know that we actually make money selling new pinball machines because the advertising costs for us are so high. We do make money selling used pinball machines because not a lot of people do that yet, but it's a challenge that we're going to face. I'm not going to get you all into the gritty about that, but something that we're working on and trying to, how do we stand apart as a pinball retailer? Um, part of that may be connecting more with people who are in the hobby and selling to them. A lot of times we, they want to sell us their games because we're one of the biggest buyers of used pinball machines, of course, in the country. Um, but not all the time we're getting that business in terms of the new unbox stuff and we're trying to figure that out. Certainly I think we'll treat you well if you do, but um, we're working on that. A lot of customers will not buy a pinball machine. If you think about who our customers are and the people who have a finished basement, they've got extra money to spend, they like pinball, have a game room or whatnot. Not a lot of those guys want to buy a machine unless they actually see and play it. And it's always been a challenge for us being in Columbia, Missouri. We have people travel from all over the place into Columbia, Missouri, play a bunch of our pinball machines in our showroom and ultimately leave with one. About 80 or 90 percent people do actually buy one if they come visit us. And how do we get more collections of pinball machines that we can sell nationwide? It's a, it's a problem that we're trying to solve. Um, the white glove delivery provi providers, um, they let our customers down a lot of the times. Um, it's, it's high, it's very expensive to use uh, some of these white glove providers. And a lot of times the guys who are delivering those pinball machines to our affluent customers, I can tell you story after story after story, um, they, they do let us down. And when we come to the pinball company and, and our interaction with our customers from, they search, they wanna buy a pinball machine, they come to our website, they find the one that they want, we answer the phone, we sell them one, they have a you know, problem after the sale, we take care of them. But that at delivery, a lot of times customers are let down and we wanna take more control of that, that, that process, that part of the whole transaction. So those are the three main challenges I think the pinball company or really any online pinball retailer faces right now. So we thought about, um, well, well, what if we just put pinball stores all across the country and at least in the major markets? So then those people who call us and they're in New York City or Chicago or Dallas or Miami and they say, I'm interested in buying a pinball machine, we say, yeah, we've got a showroom. It's called the Pin Pinball Co. And what would that look like? So I hired a designer and had some 3D renderings made and we came up with something like this, which I think looks awesome. I think it would be awesome to have here in Chicago, but we decided that the overhead paying rent, paying someone to stand there, let people come in, um, play pinball machines with their kids, and then like, this is great, but we don't have $6,000 to spend. Um, I don't know 100% sure that it wouldn't, we wouldn't sell some pinball machines, but I do know 100% sure that it, it'd be a little risky venture. So around the time we were exploring that as an option, um, if you go forward a couple slides, you'll see a couple more pictures of this store. That's, no, you're good, right there, right there. Um, we had been spending some time every year when we go to Vegas at the Pinball Hall of Fame. And we thought, this kind of looks like the Pinball Company showroom, but the guy's collecting quarters. And theoretically, all those machines could be for sale. And so things started clicking in my brain, the pieces of the puzzle started to come together and I thought, wait a minute, we just need to buy the Pinball Hall of Fame. Well, so we did. We, we, we heard that he was interested in selling and we had the conversation. We went down there, meaningful conversations about what this machine, what, you know, what, what would you sell it for? And we agreed to a price and um, shook hands and um, sent him the paperwork as soon as I got back to Columbia. And I'm not, I'm not stepping on anybody's toes here. I think Tim's a great guy and what he built was awesome. And that's why I was willing to pay a lot of money for this thing because I knew, I heard it through the rumor mill that he didn't want it anymore. He wanted to kind of transition and we thought we'd be good buyers of that business, but it didn't work out for one reason or another. And until recently, we thought we maybe we still had a deal or we could finish a deal when he was finally ready. But then I heard, oh, we're moving closer to the strip and we're expanding. So rather than, uh, no, we're not selling to you, I heard that. So I have a feeling he's not really, he's not really wanting to sell. And again, nothing against him. I think it's a great business. I hope he's very successful. But that way to bridge the gap and have a showroom with that many machines in a city like Las Vegas, our whole idea was to have the Pinball Hall of Fame 
Chicago, Pinball Hall of Fame Dallas. So I got another agreement with him, a sh handshake type thing. I said, well, would it be reasonable while you're still mulling over this idea of selling the Pinball Hall of Fame, what if I license the name from you? And you know, if you know Tim, you know he's very charitable. He gives a lot to Salvation Army. It's, a non, it's run as a non-for-profit. Uh, we were going to turn it into a for-profit and make it a real Vegas attraction. I had, you know, this thought in my head, an artist work on some renderings, a big saltwater aquarium in the middle with alcohol, because if you go pro for profit, you can sell alcohol, right? We had all these ideas, and I was really let down when I found out that, you know, we weren't going to be able to buy this thing. Um, but, but then I started thinking, you know, uh, if, if, if it's not Pinball Hall of Fame, what about Chicago? I was going to do Pinball Hall of Fame Chicago, so my idea was to open all these Hall of Fames. Well, why don't we just call it Chicago Pinball Hall of Fame? And I don't see a problem with that. Maybe he does, or maybe his lawyers do. But me, I think we, we thought it was a good idea. We weren't going to give up on this idea of having Pinball Hall of Fame type places as great as the one in Las Vegas or better all across the country and serve as our showroom. So that's what we're doing. Um, so in the meantime, while we're thinking, we're going to do this someday. We're going to find the right place in Chicago and open Pinball, Pinball Hall of Fame. I came up here, and the nice people at Stern gave me a tour uh, of five different barcades here, and I thought my hometown of Columbia, Missouri needed a place like that, focused on pinball. And uh, we got a lot of ideas, and we found, finally found a place in Columbia, Missouri, um, and we opened what we call Silver Ball. And it's been open one year now, and I just want to show you some pictures of the interior. And the purpose of this is, one, it's just to show you who aren't familiar what our take is of a bar barcade. And two is to give you an idea of the types of finishes that you might have seen in Vegas if we did buy the Pinball Hall of Fame, what we could do. You know, we've got crystal chandeliers in there. It's kind of more industrial. It's got brick. It kind of feels, you know, like an old warehouse. But we've kind of spruced the place up. Go, go to the next slide. There's our roll of pinball machines up above. So we have pinball league there every Wednesday, every Monday, every Monday night. And then once a month on Sunday, we have the stern army there playing um, tournaments this is the upstairs we have like all new arcades like mario karts cruising blast ski ball pop a shot so forth uh, pac-man battle royale stuff like that this is the lounge where we have private parties it's got a dan led dance bar and stuff but anyway just just give you an idea this was just a basically a rundown you know hole in the wall bar that the college kids didn't seem to mind to get drunk in but I turned it into something I think is pretty cool and special in Columbia and kind of what I want to do with the Hall of Fame. So I don't, I would love to have had renderings done and a logo and everything created by today, but I don't. But that at least gives you a, a kind of a hint of what can be done with a place that's centered on pinball. Um, so raise your hand if you've heard that we're opening the Chicago Pinball Hall of Fame and, and that's probably why you're here and you bared with me as I told you all about the boring stuff about how the pinball company started. But I'm trying to bridge the gap here. I'm trying to show you why. I think it's going to be awesome. But the, the why is in solving some of those problems. And having a base here in Chicago has been something I've been thinking about for a long time. And, um, and not a pinball company in Chicago, but it'll be the, the Chicago Pinball of Fame. But it'll be our, uh, we'll own every machine in there. It'll be our showroom for customers in the Chicago area. But the people who love pinball who are in Chicago and passing through, this, I think this will be a great attraction for them to come, come play it. Um, we plan to open this by, if everything works out, by next year's expo. So next time, if you come back to Chicago every year from out of town, we hope that you can stop by the Chicago Pinball Hall of Fame. Maybe me and Rob can work out a deal where if you get admission here, we'll give you free admission uh, for that weekend to come play pinball machines at the uh, Chicago Pinball Hall of Fame. Kind of see what we, what we did with the place. Uh, we plan on having it more modern pinball machines, um, so things made roughly 1990 to present, which is what we sell on our website. Uh, we will have a selection of EM machines because we do want to tell the story of pinball. Think of this as more of a museum, having a more museum quality than the Pinball Hall of Fame does in Las Vegas. Um, we're going to have um, actual exhibit area. I've been reached out to already by people who, uh, maybe you're in this room, um, who want to curate some um, exhibits. Um, we might have an exhibit about, where'd Roger go? Roger's still here? About that story, which is obviously fascinating. Roger Sharp and the New York uh, City story. Um, we might have a month where we focus on futuristic pinball machines like Star Wars and whatnot. What's up, Todd? Hi. <laughs> I told the story about 
you weren't here, but I told a story about uh, the first pinball machine we ever bought or sold, 2006, was a Rolling Stones, and you don't know this, was a, was a Rolling Stones pinball machine, and I bought it from you. So you were my, you, you were my wholesale distributor back then, and uh, so 2006, 12 years ago. You probably don't, do you remember the machine? <laughs> Ed Sheeran, okay. So he was playing a Rolling Stone. And there were two kids down at the main music center playing Rolling Stones. And then we also use our kids Rolling Stones uh, at the Franklin Institute. We support all the local museums and stuff, and we offer at cost, literally at cost, free rentals that basically just cover our expenses. And the Rolling Stones, not yours, but another one, was down at the Institute's 8-bit night. And we had it open. And we made pictures and drawings pointing to each part inside the machine. This is a computer. We know the processor. This is the driver board, the lamp driver. We kind of make it in, uh, instructional, but then they could play it too. And it just happened to be the stones. <laughs> that worked that good. Well, we don't, we don't, we don't sell machines. We remember we sell machines from the 70s. But that guy, my very first customer, was hell bent on buying one, and I went, found you. Bought it from you, sold it to him. I had a first, my very first happy customer. So anyway, got to give me like ten more minutes, okay? And then it's your turn. Okay. Um, where were we? Okay, so you're you're gonna see a selection of new arcades, uh, not like your tr your traditional barcade, more like the silver ball, where you're gonna have the new driving games and shooting games like Walking Dead and stuff that the kids want to play, right? Yes, hand in the back. Absolutely. Okay, we'll get there, but the, but the new arcades will be, I think, going to be on coin play, either that or maybe some kind of card swipe thing. The kid, that's more for the kids that have something to do while dad plays pinball machines for five hours or whatever. But um, we'll have those games. We'll have a full bar with beer and frozen drink machines. We'll have an exhibit area. We'll have a party area where you can actually book an area for corporate parties, and we will have a repair room, similar to the one at the, sh at the, silver, at the, at the pinball company. But my idea is that, of course, we're going to be working on these machines as they need service. We'll, we'll bring them back there, they'll be propped up, and people will be able to see people working on pinball machines and like what goes into you know, the wiring and everything like that. And we'll, we'll invite people back there as we do tours and stuff. That when we, at the pinball company, we have kids come in and from the schools and stuff that are coming in and tour, and we show them, look what's underneath, oh, all the wiring. And you know, it's, still, it's still really interesting to know what goes on under the glass of a pinball machine. So it's going to just show people, maybe the kids, go in and do you want to see what under versus having to do that in the show or, or in the Hall of Fame. We'll just bring them back in there and show them all the stuff that goes into pinball. But that's you know, the basic of the stuff that's going to be there. The next slide will show you. You can't read this unless you're me and um, have really good eyes. But uh, these are all the machines that we hope to be there. This is like the 95% share. These are going to be there. This is like the criteria is like if you're like in the top 50 on pin side um, and you have um, and you're from 1990 to present, you can probably find that at the Pinball Hall of Fame. That's the type of machines that we sell. The next slide is more. But are you going to get to his question about the coin drop on the pinball machine? Yeah, which is the next slide. Yeah. Maybe two more slides. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, all right. You, this is what you want to see. This is for you, and everybody else. But yeah, we've heard. Of course, we're doing our research and we're finding out what other places are charging and how they're doing this. And this isn't set in stone. And I can give you the reasoning why we decided to land here. Initially, we thought, okay, ten dollars, all you can play all day. Well, I know you guys would be tearing my machines up for hours for 10 bucks, right? Um, it's, it's a good deal, but I also thought most people want to pop in for a little bit, check this out, check the exhibit out, play some pinball machines, and 10 bucks is probably fair per hour. But I also thought that people who are going to stay extended period of time, charging $10 per hour kind of sounded a little high to me. So I thought if you're going to be there several hours, but you don't really want to be looking at your clock, like, oh, gosh, I'm going to pay another $10 if I stay another 10 minutes. Uh, I just thought, let's just do a half-day admission for $15. And then I also thought there'd be people who might, like, okay, well, I'm going to play, and then I'm going to invite my buddy back, but I'm going to come back tonight. Do I have to pay a second time? I thought, well, you know, just pay an all-day fee, 
Um, and then you can play literally from open to close if you want to. That's why we're going to have food and, you know, food and be you know, beer and stuff so that you, you don't have to leave if you want to. So you can really veg out with your friends and just play pinball all day long for 20 bucks if you really want to. I don't think we're going to sell a whole lot of those, but at least gives you some options. Um, what about the kids? Well, the little, little, little kids aren't playing pinball yet, unfortunately. Maybe we can make something where they can. But my son is six years old. He's certainly old enough to play pinball. He's actually pretty good at it, well, getting better than me. So I thought from that age to about you know 11 or 12, again, not set in stone, they're going to pay five bucks all day. So if I want to bring my two kids or three kids or 10 kids, I don't care where you have, I'm only going to charge you five bucks for the kids and they can play pinball all day. You know, it's really cool with the outing. I want to take my kids and expose them to pinball, but I don't want to pay a bunch of money. I get that. I'm a parent too. So that's where the reasoning is behind that type of pricing. And um, I think it's fair. Certainly let me know if it's not fair, but I think that this is a very fair way to do it. I don't think that we're going to make a killing. I think this is more about exposing people to pinball than making money. This is really about just doing something we think is going to be special in Chicago than making money. Um, and hopefully we'll sell a few machines that, while we're at it. I think that was, ah, where? Where's this thing going to be? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, so we do have a letter of intent signed, which for those of you who know who signed leases, which means that we've agreed to terms. We haven't seen the space, which we're going to do right after this. Um, it's in Schaumburg. Um, our criteria when we wanted to find a place in Chicago would be a place that a lot of people know, a lot of people visit. It's got at least 12,000 square feet of space to rent, you know, just a ton of foot traffic. Um, and, you know, as soon as you tell, I had, I actually reached out to all the, you know, a lot of the big property owners, a lot of the big mall op operators, Simon Properties, Brookfield Properties, Tobman, all those guys, and said, I want to do this. And some of them said, you're crazy, we'll never, you know, never make it work. Another one says, we want that at our property. And those are the ones I ended up working with. And I'm still working with a couple of them, but I think we found what we think is going to be an amazing location in Schaumburg. But they're kind of like, why don't you, you, you can just say that you're negotiating, you can say some things, and you can maybe even say that it's Woodfield Mall, but maybe, you know, you know don't tell them that you have a lease sign or anything. But they said, it's, it, you're, you're, not, you're saying factual information by saying that we're negotiating and that you have a letter of intent signed at Woodfield Mall. So, you know, that's what we're looking. But they're not going to say it's going to be there. That's just, you know, we're pretty confident that we're going to work something out, but, um, oh, so this is just for, instead of, you know, this is, um, if you don't know who our, what our names are, or if you want to reach us by email, or that's our office number, you can get your phone out, add a contact. If you have more questions about the, pin, the Chicago Pinball of Fame, the pinball company, anything, um, I wanted to make sure you had all my information, but this is a good time to ask questions about the Chicago Pinball of Fame project, um, anything about the pinball company at all. So. Yes. No, they they didn't tell me about a failed game room there. Oh no. Um, okay. So, so there is level two fifty seven is there, which is Namco's FEC concept does really well. Um, they have a new Lego type thing going. I guess we'll find out when we get there that they're really excited about. I think they have 11 restaurants. So when, you know, that 12th restaurant comes along that has something different, you, I don't think that they're really worried about the fact that there's 11 other restaurants. I think if you have something cool and you have 25 million people at that mall every year, I think you're going to do okay. So the idea, and this is really to grow the pie, to, get, to expose more people to pinball. So you're at the Woodfield, you're one of those 25 million people, and let's say 24.9 million of those people are, yeah, are, are not pinball hobbyists. They're going to walk by with their kids and they're like, oh my gosh, what's this? Yeah, you can go in there. Five bucks for the kids, right? Ten bucks. And they're going to start playing some pinball. And we hope to maybe build a memory that will last and get them why don't we have a pinball machine in our house, Mom, Dad? And maybe years from that, you know, I remember playing pinball, and we went to Woodfield Mall, and we played 100 pinball, and we spent all day there for five bucks when I was a little kid. Ultimately, it was, t you know, more than that. But, you know, I'm trying to build memories here in Chicago, people and exposing them to pinball, and I'm trying to do my best shot by being at a place that has a lot of foot traffic. And, um, and we're, we're doing this privately funded, our business. Um, we, we're going to have to raise some capital for talking to our bank. But this is going to happen. And, you know, we're not asking for anybody's money. We're just asking for your support. And, and, and because I think this is something going to be special. So tell your friends, even if you're in Chicago, check this thing out. And next year, Pinball Expo, 
check this thing out. Hopefully it'll be open by then. Did I overcommit? <laughs> if this thing doesn't happen now, you guys are, I'm like the evil man. He said you were building the Chicago. I mean, we're, we're, we're going to do the, our darn best. Of course, things aren't signed. You know, we don't have the 150 machines ready to move over there yet, but we're going to do our best to do that. So other questions? Yes. Gotcha. Um, so the, the idea behind it was to, you know, we think the Pinball Hall of Fame in Las Vegas is something special. It's obviously historic, the story behind Tim and how he created it. If you read the website, you talk to Tim, you're like, this is really something special. It's a family thing, you know, him and Charlotte. And so I really wanted to transition. If it took 10 years, I said, Tim, you're not going away. And when I say we're buying it, it's not, it's like, I wanted to really make sure this thing stayed past Tim. Okay. And so that was the idea, not just that I wanted to buy somebody's baby, but I wanted to make sure that it lived past him, kind of like Gamer Magazine, but you know, I, I really thought it was special. And so um, the idea was just really Pinball Hall of Fame, Las Vegas. Let's just use that same name other places. And people who've been to Las Vegas kind of have an idea of what, what it should be like. And, and of course, you know, me kind of upgrading Pinball Las Vegas was a goal of mine. And I think the current space is great. If you get rid of a lot of the clutter and junk, I think, and put the right machines in there, I don't think it needs to move, but you know, he can run his business not for profit the way he wants. Uh, I just think that um, when I thought about that and I was so committed to Pinball Hall of Fame Chicago being the first license of that name, and the deal was very good. And this also speaks to Tim. He, it was basically 2% of our income, our revenue, not income, but revenue. And I was, he was gonna give it 100% at the Salvation Army. And so he was raising more money for charity by just lending out the name. And uh, I think that was honorable. Um, and I'll, we, of course, like, like we would still love to tie um, charitable giving and philanthropy to, the, if it does really well, and it doesn't do really well. Somehow, when you are supporting pinball, you're also supporting charity. Um, but, uh, and that we, you know, and, and Tim does that, but does that still to this day. So. Um, the question about licensing, I, I guess I, I like the name Pinball Hall of Fame, and I just said, let's just flip it around. And, you know, if you, if you type in, if you just Google Baseball Hall of Fame, there's like a hundred of them, right? There's like the African American, there's like every, every team has their Pinball Hall of Fame, every city, every state, every country, the, the U.S., the, the Cuban. So I thought, there's no problem in using Pinball Hall of Fame. It was just a matter of, you know, flipping around and calling it the Chicago Pinball Hall of Fame. I haven't gotten any flack, but I'm just the type of guy like worries about, oh my God, is he gonna be hate me because I use that? No, I mean, I, I'm very confident that, that the Chicago Pinball Hall of Fame should be here. I mean, the, my goal is to make it awesome and, and, and the best place to play a bunch of pinball machines in one place and, and you know, we're respective of what other people do. But you're raising your hand, but you don't want me. Anybody else have a question about the Chicago Pinball Hall of Fame? Raise your hand if you think you're gonna go, if you're excited about maybe visiting next year or if you're from Chicago. We hope you do. Um, maybe it'll take me a little longer and it's not done, but it's certainly if you like the Facebook page, um, it already has like 500 likes. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's a concept, it's, it's, it's got 500 likes. Um, we're gonna promote it for the pinball company for our Chicago customers, of course, and let them know first, hey, all you guys in Chicago who are our customers are thinking about being customers, all of our Facebook friends are gonna be there. So I imagine the first, you know, at least few weeks will be busy and after that, we'll just kind of see. Hopefully you guys, hopefully it's supported by the people in the hobby and people send people that way, but hopefully people who are just in the mall learn about pinball because of it. Other questions? Questions for Brooke? <laughs> about working with me? <laughs> yes, <laughs> good. No. My, you know, they're going to let us do, of course, mall hours, but they're going to let us actually go beyond mall hours. So um, what that means in Illinois, I don't know. At the Silver Ball, it's 1 a.m., but if, if, if places can be open until 2 a.m., I don't know. But we have our own, the place that we're looking at, um, that, of course, you know, they don't want to just get out there because they're running a business there now, but the place that we're looking at going um, actually has an exterior entrance, so a restaurant entrance. So, um, so yeah, so we'll be able to open our own hours. We can just close the mall gate and people can be there to whatever that time is that's allowed to serve alcohol, I guess. I don't know. Um, yeah. 2 a.m. See, in Missouri, it's 1 a.m. So 2 a.m. is an extra hour of business, so it's good. Yeah. Is there a question back there? Uh, yeah. In the back. Not 
really, a couple friends of mine did have old pinball machines in their basements and I, I did play. Never in a million years would have I thought that that would have become what we centered our business around, you know, and that that's what I would be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, really no ties, you know. It just kind of came from an opportunity that Nick had while, while working at Amini's and we, we would have never thought when we met that this is what we would be doing. No, <laughs> no. Am I getting the hook? Is this the hook? Yeah. <laughs> one more question and then that's it. So make it a good one. Right here, yes. <sighs> they wouldn't fit in my carry-on. <laughs> last, well, two years ago, when last time we were here at Expo, I brought a bunch of us, and we had a booth and everything. Um, and, and we all have, maybe Texas. You gonna go to Texas Pinball Festival? No, sorry. Um, but yeah, we had full intent on bringing up a load of magazines and having it in the booth. Give me your address, we'll mail you a couple. We'll get you, whatever you want. Every issue on us. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that was, I'm getting the hook. So thank you for coming.